Okay, so starting again, because I was muted. Maybe you needed some extra silence today. Anyway, just another warm welcome to everybody, whether you were with us yesterday or you're joining for the first time. I heard that somebody here is on retreat for the first time, but it really doesn't make a lot of difference because every moment is the first time for all of us, right? We sort of carry this idea along with us sometimes that I'm the meditator or I, this is my, you know, 25th retreat or whatever it is. But really, you know, starting with a fresh mind every moment is, is where we want to be. And sometimes beginners are actually better at that, you know, because you don't know what to expect when you come to retreat. So yesterday, uh, for those who weren't here, we talked about making peace with our body and with our breath. And of course, like anything, you know, that we talk about in this natural world, it's all interrelated. So as we come into contact with the body and breath, we also start to get a window into our emotional world, <clears throat> into the world of thoughts, into the world of emotions that are so um, connected to sensations in our body, to energies moving through our body. And that's one of the translations of the word emotion. It actually means um, energy in motion. So today I wanted to look at a little bit more closely at emotions this morning and then in the afternoon at thoughts and thinking and how we can find some skillful ways to um, handle and to relate to thoughts in a way that um, helps us incline towards the thoughts that will lead us towards happiness and peace and helps us to handle those thoughts that don't you know, without over identifying, without getting stuck or getting trapped in, in sort of loop patterns, which can actually build emotions. So we're going to look at that later. But um, this morning, I wanted to talk about emotions and give some practical tips for maybe coming into contact and learning to remain present to our emotional world. So we do experience thousands of emotions, apparently, every day, which is incredible to imagine, isn't it? You know, sometimes in Buddhism, we think that the path will um, sort of, what do you call, dull our emotional world. But in fact, being human be means experiencing emotions. And in Buddhism, emotions aren't seen as anything necessarily negative or for sure, there are some emotions which are um, more difficult to handle. We can call them afflictive states such as greed, hatred, anything based on <clears throat> greed, hatred and delusion. Um, but it's not so much a judgment as just a, an aspect of wisdom that's able to discern between those emotions that we wish to cultivate and those emotions that we need to learn just to face and to accept and gradually make peace with and, and let go. Yeah, so there's something called kusala and akusala, which could be translated as wholesome and unwholesome, beneficial and unbeneficial, skillful or unskillful. So we do have that kind of dichotomy, but often things are somewhere in the middle. And the way we relate to our emotional world is also a big determinant of our well-being and how well we thrive. So it's not that any one emotion is um, to be avoided altogether. It's largely to do with the way we relate, the way we handle and skillfully um, come in contact with our emotional world. <clears throat> so there's this um, lovely teaching by a woman called Susan, oh, what's her second name? Susan Davis, I think, who talked about emotional agility. And I really love this term, emotional agility, because it carries the connotation of being able to sort of flow through with our emotions and not get stuck or... Um, fixated to one particular emotion but having some sort of agility to be able to um, relate to them in a way that um, opens them up to us and enables us to learn from our emotional world. So one of the things she says is that emotions give us information about what we really value in life. So for example you know people who are very involved in social justice are inevitably going to at times feel anger but in a way that anger may motivate them then to make changes because underneath that anger if you really look at why you're upset why you're frustrated or even sometimes feeling emotions of despair it can be because of your love of justice your love of equality you know your deep wish um, for other people's well-being yeah to dissolve some of these inequities and 
and work towards a more um, equal society where the wealth is more evenly distributed, for example, you know, whatever it is that sort of uh, brings you that sense of passion and wanting to make change. So um, Susan Davis, I think that's her name. I hope I've not got her name wrong, but it's definitely Susan anyway. Um, she talks about getting familiar with those emotions and noticing how often they are values aligned. And if we can see what's behind them and see the beauty that's there, we can then uh, learn to let go of the more destructive or negative aspects of the way we relate to those emotions. So it doesn't mean not having emotions. It just means being able to be steady and present and resilient with our emotional world. And you may have noticed, you know, that if um, people who are around others sometimes with strong emotions, if there's a sense of discomfort there in you, for example, when somebody else is sad or crying or expressing fear, it's often because we haven't learned to um, integrate those same emotions within ourselves. And so we're actually uncomfortable with other people presenting those emotions to us or uncomfortable of being in the presence of people who are emotional. And um, I would classify myself as a very sensitive person. There's actually a term for that nowadays. It's called the highly sensitive person. And um, for much of my life, I've been told that I'm oversensitive, you know, or over emotional or overreactive. And I realized quite early on in my life that that really means that the person who says that is not comfortable um, being present for me. And this is in, you know, in many cases because they're not comfortable with those emotions within themselves. And so we tend to stigmatize emotions, you know, either in ourselves or in others. And I think it's so helpful to talk about the place of emotions in our life, just to start to um, shift any of that stigma that we have developed around feeling and expressing emotions because a lot of that is conditioned, you know, through society or the way you're brought up. You know, there's often that, um, for men who are brought up, there's often this idea that men shouldn't cry. You know, many boys are told, oh, you know, you're a boy, be strong, be brave, don't show tears, don't show sadness, you know. But one of the bravest things we can actually do is to show our emotions, show up for our emotions and learn to be vulnerable. And by being vulnerable, we give other people permission to be vulnerable too. And so can you see how this like um, bringing emotions to light helps to in a way dissolve their power. You know, they're things we are able to now talk about. There's a little bit of space between you and what you experience. It doesn't have to overwhelm you. You know, sometimes we think with emotions that we are the emotion. How many times do we say, I'm sad or I'm lonely, I'm depressed, I'm full of guilt. I mean, I'm full of guilt is a bit different, but I'm guilty, I'm guilty. <laughs> Instead of saying, oh, there's sadness or I'm experiencing depression. You know, I'm having feelings of guilt right now. There's a difference there. And that difference is that we're not identifying with the emotion so closely. We're seeing it as something that arises and passes through. Yeah, energy and motion these things are supposed to come and to pass through and it's only when we kind of clamp down on them either through the unskillful patterns of repression or overexpression, that we actually build those emotions in our mind <clears throat> so our patterns are conditioned and sometimes you know this uh tendency that most of us have to some degree of trying to sort of stifle down the emotion or push it away, push it aside, can have its place. You know, especially if somebody has been like through in intense trauma, sometimes it's too much for them to start feeling their emotions all at once. And they've had to manage that by um, even dissociating at times from the intense experiences that they've had. And that can work for a while but the danger with that is that you have this sense of being in control of the emotion. You're having control over it and you're using willpower to do that. So it kind of increases a sense of self in the sense that um, you're the one in charge of that emotion. And it also means that you're holding back 
from the truth of your emotional world. So there's a lot of distance between you and what you're experiencing deep inside. And when we push things down like that into our subconscious, they don't go away. They actually carry on gaining energy, gaining momentum in that subconscious realm to the extent that um, they can actually become amplified. And I'm sure you've all experienced to greater or lesser degrees the phenomenon of when you know, you're having a certain emotion, perhaps for a long time. Maybe you're in a job that you don't really want to be in that's not giving you joy and you're just stuffing down that feeling of you know, being somehow exploited or not being empowered enough to make a change. And over time, it sort of builds. And then even a small thing can trigger quite a big um, re response. Yeah, It's as though you've put that emotion under layers of maybe grass and then soil and then maybe even concrete over the top. And eventually the energy of that is getting so strong that it has to explode. So they say, you know, that this kind of um, pattern can lead to either an explosion where that emotion spills over into, you know, speech or, or action. Unfortunately, it can happen even, you know, people becoming violent towards another person, which happened to me actually with a friend who had this pattern of suppression. You know, one day she just blew up and became violent all of a sudden. And it looked like it came out of the blue, but I know that it was building over many, many years, you know, of trying to keep it down and trying to be equanimous and, and this particular person actually said to me once that um, emotions are useless. Emotions are useless. I don't want to have emotions, they're useless. So they hadn't been feeling into their emotional world for so long, you know, that suddenly it all came out, triggered by something seemingly quite small. So there's this nice, uh, I think it's Christopher Germer. He has this lovely little phrase. He says, what you resist persists <laughs> and this is true isn't it it's almost like um you've had your lunch and I don't know how much time you all found yesterday but hopefully you found enough time to wash the pots it's usually not what we want to do straight after eating but if we wash those dishes straight away the food comes off <laughs> it's easy to wash them because it hasn't become kind of compacted and hard and congealed but if you leave those dishes even for half a day it becomes a little bit harder and you need to get the scrubbing brush onto those dishes. If you leave them for the whole day, <laughs> it's really gross. You have to soak them first of all, right? And then you might go for the wire wool, the brillo pad that we have in England. If you leave them for like a week, oh, I actually went to visit someone once and she'd left her dishes for more than a week. It was, there was no cutlery at all. I couldn't believe how much cutlery she actually had and uh, many, many bowls full of dirty dishes. And she was so overwhelmed, she didn't know where to begin. So I said, okay, let's just start together. And as we went through it, she felt some relief. <laughs> and it's a similar thing with our emotional world. You know, The longer we leave things unaddressed or unexplored, un, yeah, unconscious in our mind, <clears throat> the more they kind of build up this, um, this residue and become the emotions become caked <laughs> to our mind. Um, but even when we start to notice, okay, there's this problem I have, maybe I can just begin here and start cleaning the fork or cleaning the spoon. It's already quite a relief because things are starting to move. You know, that dirt is starting to shift. The emotions are starting to move through again. So again, as always, you know, it's important to approach these things gently and carefully with a lot of respect for our inner world, a lot of respect for the condition of our mind right now. And um, so far I've talked mostly about emotions that are more afflictive in nature, more difficult to handle, but um, there are such things as positive emotions too. <clears throat> and in Buddhism, um, there are so many. You, know, you can see it from the beginning of the gradual training. First, we talk about training in virtue, but that virtue is motivated by compassion, non-harm, a wish for non-harm, a tenderness towards all beings. Yeah, there's this lovely quote in the suttas. It says, um, not only does, not one kill, does one not kill, but one uh, abides merciless and compassionate to all beings with rod and weapon laid aside just caring for their well-being. 
the other day I went on a walk. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm like this merciful being and always tender to all beings, but um, there was this little worm that had got stranded sort of halfway across a path and it was in like a river of rain. So I just crouched down and moved it aside. Um, and I could see that I looked like the park's local weirdo, you know, <laughs> in my funny robes, crouching by a worm. But uh, even the act of moving that worm kind of engendered this beautiful, gentle state of mind because the worm was already a little bit swollen with the, with the water and I had to be so gentle, you know. So I got hold of a stick and I realised that if this stick would poke the worm at all, it might harm it. So just that kind of real care not to harm another creature and then to put it aside into the grass. It gave me a lot of happiness and it softened my mind. It made it much more gentle much more receptive to my surroundings and of course I had to overcome the possibly negative emotion of feeling a bit weird or a bit out of place like you know people walking past so it does bring that sense of resilience and inner strength and a sense that our lives are aligned to our values which can bring happiness to our minds so the Buddha talked about a life of virtue as engendering what he called anavajasukha blameless happiness happiness that's free from remorse. So sometimes we don't notice those positive emotions because they tend to be an absence of afflictive states. But actually, there's a lot of beauty in the mind just in having a human mind. And all we need to do is just peel back those more afflictive layers to access this sense of peace and inner joy. And also the Buddha talks about contentment and simplicity really early on in the gradual training. Uh, there are other qualities like gratitude, inspiration, you know, from listening to the Dhamma or from being around wise friends. And these are some of the positive emotions we can cultivate. And of course, the most positive emotions are, are the emotions of the four Brahma Viharas. And I do really believe that these are emotional states of mind. That's my experience. You know, emotions aren't always something very intense or effusive necessarily. They can also be deeply calming, deeply um, um, a sense of being very whole. Yeah. So the emotions of compassion and metta, mudita, sympathetic joy or altruistic joy, these are emotional states. They're softenings of the mind. And Ajahn Brahm's always saying that the path into deep meditation is an emotional path. And apparently women have a better generally, okay, this is just a very generalized um, observation he has, but he says that women generally tend to be more in touch with their emotional world. And as a result, tend to be able to feel their way into deep meditation that little bit more easily or perhaps more quickly, because we have that familiarity with our emotional world. So meditation is an emotional journey, you know, it does require that familiarity with our emotions and how to handle and relate to them skillfully. And so also developing the positive emotions can really give us a kind of container to handle those more afflictive, difficult emotions too. So we're not coming at them when we're in a, a say, a very tired state of mind or you know, we're feeling a bit vulnerable or sensitive, that might not be the best time to, um, to start to really go deeply into your depression or, or the loneliness or the sadness. It may be that you first need to resource yourself a little bit by inclining the mind to positive emotions, and then gently you can approach those other emotions too. It really depends on you. Sometimes we can just be with however we feel in the moment and, and that's absolutely okay. You know, we can have the trust that we can allow ourselves to cry and to feel sadness. You know, can we trust that we'll be okay and that crying can actually be a release, a relief of emotions, sometimes emotions that are stuck. Same with things like anxiety. It's often um, a state of mind that arises because we have um, dissociated from our emotions for a long time, you know, and they've built up to the point where we feel very nervous, very anxious about actually being with ourselves. Yeah, we haven't developed that resilience. And um, although it can be very difficult to handle emotions like anxiety, especially if you're in an anxiety attack, um, still, there are things we can do to ground ourselves and to give that space 
And usually when we've gone through something like anxiety or sadness, we feel a sense of relief afterwards. Not least because you have survived, <laughs> right? Sometimes we think that emotions are going to destroy us or, you know, be the end of us, but actually they are just feelings. Yeah, the Buddha said they're just Vedana. Yeah, they're just mental states, like visitors that come and stay for a while and leave of their own accord. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about a few um, ways that I found helpful to get comfortable with my emotions and to learn how I tick, to learn what's going on there and to start to see how these emotions are built. <clears throat> and the first one, it's the middle way, let's say, between repressing and expressing, or maybe between kind of stuffing emotions down and rolling in emotions where we're a bit too close to them to see what's going on. So that, of course, the first part is just becoming aware, but becoming aware in a special kind of way what I call unconditional awareness, yeah. So just as a host would welcome guests into their house, we try to be a host who is impartial, who does not stigmatize one guest and preference another guest, yeah. How does it feel to be stigmatized, to be told you're not quite good enough, you need to be more like this other person, you know, so that I can manage, so that I can handle you. So we learn not to stigmatize our emotions, but to be a good host and offer the same hospitality to all those emotional guests who come through our door. Yeah. So, and treat them with compassion, treat them with loving kindness, the way you would like to be treated by a friend. So again, you know, having this idea that the emotions are little beings that we can then befriend puts a bit of space between you and the emotion. You're not so identified with it. You're seeing it as a visitor, which it really is. You know, no emotion lasts forever. Ajahn Chah used to say, next time you're angry, get an alarm clock or a clock and put it by you and just watch how long you can sustain that anger for. <laughs> and this is really clever because even the act of doing it, if you ever do do it, will bring a bit of lightness, a bit of humor to the whole situation. <laughs> You know, it's instead of saying, oh, God, I'm so scared of this anger. It makes me a terrible person. I'm a Buddhist. I shouldn't be angry. Anger is not spiritual. Instead, you say, OK, anger, come on. Let's see. How long can you stay there? Let me time you. One hour, two hours. Unlikely, right? <laughs> so you get your clock and you time yourself. And uh, yeah, just some ways that I've worked with emotions also is giving them a lot of space. So for example, just before I started this project, I was in a situation where I had to make a decision to stay in England. And that meant losing my visa in Australia. And it had just been put in for the second time. It was gonna be another two year training visa. And it was a really huge decision and one that I didn't really feel ready to make, but I didn't have much choice because there were only a few days left for me to, for that visa application to continue. And um, I had my flight back, but I kind of knew that I couldn't take that flight because by then we'd already asked Ajahn Brahm to come and teach in England. And, uh, you know, I knew that if he was coming, I'd have some work to do that I'd need to be in England to do. But at the same time, I didn't have a place to stay. So being a nun can be extremely, a vulnerable, you know, a very vulnerable situation because we don't have, own or handle money. And at that time, my parents weren't really happy for me to stay with them. And I didn't want to stay with them for any prolonged period of time. Um, but very fortunately for me, I had a Dhamma friend who had actually invited me for a solitary retreat in Lanzarote, of all places, where she'd rented a little uh, holiday home with another meditator. And they'd invited me to come and join them to meditate. So I had my ticket, return ticket there. And uh, they were going to take care of everything, all the food. And uh, I think my duty was just to wash up those dishes. <laughs> so I made sure I did it every day. <laughs> and, uh, and I just felt relief to land there. It was just such a sense of relief to have, you know, some ground under my feet for three weeks, actually. But I had a lot of emotions coming up during that time, sometimes really feelings of everything kind of caving in on me like a real sense of heaviness, even despair, not knowing what would happen next and whether I'd made the right decision. And um, I was practicing with it in a way whereby I would 
try not to get sucked into the intensity because our minds have this negative bias so that anything that's difficult, we tend to kind of zoom in on. And that can actually mean that we get consumed by difficult emotions. So I was noticing the tendency of my mind to just feel like that I was caving in with that caving in feeling and um, so that there was hardly any breathing space. And I would just gently keep on stretching out my awareness, keep on expanding it to the edges of my body to include the periphery, the skin, and even sometimes beyond that. So I would keep on opening up that space yeah, mentally so that my mind had more perspective and more landscape yeah so that that emotion wasn't the only thing in that emotional landscape I could also feel other things it's quite a clever way to practice because most of the time our extremities our skin and maybe the palms of our hands the soles of our feet actually have fairly neutral sensations even fairly pleasant sensations some tingling might be there or a feeling of lightness might be there you know, unless you have maybe some skin disease or something, you're not likely to experience very intense sensations in the skin. So I found that just expanding my awareness in this way really helped me to hold that heavy feeling without trying to run away from it, but just to give it more space. And by the end of those three weeks, my whole energetic field had really changed. It was quite incredible. Yeah, it was helped by the sea for sure, the sea air and the good friendship. But I think a lot of it was just learning to <clears throat> be with those emotions and let them be processed, you know, giving them that space. So after that, I went back to my parents' house just for a few days and I could just feel how my whole body was so much more relaxed. And it was really interesting because my mum then said, oh, I wish you were staying for longer. <laughs> Whereas before it had been like, you can't stay here long. And uh, but anyway, I only had sort of two, three days to stay there. And from there, I felt like I could face what was to come, which was a lot of unknown. But step by step, step by step, things started to fall into place. I re still remember when we got our first £10 donation into our um, bank account for Anocampo. And it was like, wow, someone's made a donation. This is amazing. And from there, you know, we organised the retreats with Ajahn Brahm. And we actually started to feel a little bit, uh, yeah, like this project could be viable. And so those initial feelings of anxiety have now passed away. And that's an important point also, because sometimes we tend to invest a lot of belief in our emotions and feel that they really do mean something about ourselves or about what's going to happen later, especially feelings like anxiety, fear, um, even guilt, you know guilt means that I must have done something wrong I must be a bad person there must be some intrinsic flaw in me but most of the time they don't mean that you know they don't actually have the meaning we ascribe to them they're just anxiety can just be a sign that we're moving into territory that is unfamiliar for us you know and we're not sure we're moving into the unknown it doesn't mean anything's going to go wrong it just means you're a little bit outside of your comfort zone Guilt can just mean that perhaps you've always been used to pleasing other people and you feel, you know, you have to say yes. So when you feel no, say no, you feel like, oh, dear, you know, have I done something wrong? Was it selfish to say no and put my own needs first? But actually, you have just honoured your own values. Maybe you said no to going out to the pub to have a drink or you said, you know, I'll just have a glass of water or orange juice. So, yes, it feels uncomfortable at the time. But by saying no to one thing, you're actually saying yes to yourself. You're actually saying yes to your own value system. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually something that's worthy of respect. And you may then become a person who inspires others to be more true to their own value system too. So the Dalai Lama also points out really wisely that, um, that Positive emotions don't always come about straight away when we live aligned to our ethics and our values. Sometimes we don't experience happiness immediately. Yeah, Sometimes it's actually uncomfortable. For example, if you um, make a New Year's resolution 
no no hints here <laughs> to meditate twice a day <laughs> initially it will feel uncomfortable because you're disciplining you you're trying to you know have some more discipline in your daily schedule it might not feel pleasant but in the long run it will have pleasant consequences the effects will be beneficial in the long run so we don't always experience happiness straight away but when things are aligned with our values they um, generate a deeper, more lasting and more wholesome happiness in the long run for us. Yeah. So we can't always know that our actions are wholesome or unwholesome just by the instant results we get. It's much more helpful to look at where we're coming from yeah, than the feeling that we get. So we can't always trust our emotions. And I think that's, or, or let's say, you know, we can trust them in the sense that they're real and they're present for us, but we don't necessarily need to believe in them, that they're these kind of, that they really are saying something about ourselves or about what's going to happen in our life. That's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> so I've talked about giving them space um, and I'm going to skip on a few of the things I wanted to say, because as usual, there's a lot. Um, but I think the next important thing when we've learned to meet those emotions with unconditional awareness, we've learned to handle them gently, kindly, without stigmatizing them, giving them some space, approaching them bit by bit, yeah, taking a step back if it gets overwhelming, maybe changing your posture, moving into some walking meditation, perhaps even going outside, just having a look at the nature getting that sense of perspective again, yeah? especially if you are in some kind of conditioned trauma response or you're feeling overwhelmed by sadness. One time I went to Ajahn Brahm and I was feeling quite a lot of anxiety for some reason. And uh, as I was talking to him, he was sort of looking out of the window and I was thinking, hmm, are you listening to me? <laughs> but, <laughs> but then he started to engage me in that and sort of start saying, look at the color on the trees. I'm just kind of captivated. Look at the way that they're just moving really gently. And I sort of looked out and, and saw that. And it just gave me this sense of spaciousness and, and perspective. You know, It was like cutting through that feedback loop of anxiety. And we continued to talk about the emotion, but now I had just that little pause that gave me a bit more perspective because he could see I was getting, you know, sucked in. So that can also be helpful. And it's hard to remember to do that, but if we can remember to just pause, take a break, it can be very helpful. So the last thing I wanted to mention was investigating emotions with wisdom, yeah, using the tools of impermanence and non-self. So first of all, again, you know, noticing that these emotions are always in a flux. They're always in a flow. The intensity changes. So often you hear people talking about being depressed and maybe their depression has lasted for 23 years. And when I read that, I think, yes, you know, you have been having periods of depression across 23 years. But there would have also been times during that 23 years when the depression was absent for a while, you know, or when the depression was less intense than at other times. In this particular case, someone was talking about their experience with bipolar, which is an incredibly debilitating disease where, you know, the brain um, chemistry is actually affected. So, so it is a, a, an illness that somebody is not in control of in any way. But even then, I cannot believe that during those 23 years, that person didn't have moments of even joy, even peace, when that depression was absent. But unfortunately, when we're in an episode of really intense, say, depression or anxiety or fear, despair, we tend to join it up with all the other times we've had those emotions. And our perception of our past then looks as though it was only comprised of depression. You know, so... Our experience now tends to determine how we perceive our past and also how we project into the future. When we're depressed, we think we're always going to be depressed. And in a sense, you know, that depression does have a very heavy quality. It is something that feels quite stuck. But if we can get familiar with it and notice the times when it's lighter, when it's lifted, yeah, even if only just before you sleep, <laughs> you might notice that, you know, you're not quite so identified. It's getting a bit lighter 
or the moment you wake up, yeah, you might be feeling depressed, but there might also be a sense of, you know, renewed energy to start the day with. So these emotions are not permanent and there's some fluctuation within them. And if we can see when they're absent and even see when other emotions are present, then it gives us a way into understanding their impermanent nature. Yeah, there's a quote I wanted to share by somebody called Godwin Samaratne. They're a very beautiful Sri Lankan um, lay teacher. Uh, I think they passed away a while ago. I'm not sure how long ago, probably within the last 10 years. But he has this lovely phrase. He says, the real security comes from being open to insecurity. And I think that's so wonderful because when we learn to embrace our emotional world, and stop avoiding that emotional world. It gives us a sense of almost being invincible. There's nothing we're really afraid to experience anymore. We know it's arising and passing. We know it's uncertain, but our security doesn't come from having to experience one particular kind of emotion over another. It becomes, our security is from being able to be open to all. Yeah. Knowing that we have that capacity of unconditional awareness that we have a way to handle these and that these things are impermanent. We can get familiar with that insecurity and become secure in knowing that we can handle that. <clears throat> and then lastly, learning that these emotions, again, do not belong to me. They're things that I experience, but they're not mine. They're not me. I am not the sadness. I am not the, um, the joy. You know, how often is it that we experience a positive emotion and we say, oh, now I feel like myself again. Now I'm back to my old self. So we're still identified. Even even the joy, even the peace is not really you. It's a visitor that comes. It's something that's causally arisen. There are certain causes we can put in place and that will result in peace, that will result in joy and loving kindness. But when those causes are not there, then those emotions may not be so predominant either. So this is good. It's not a negative thing whereby we're sort of at the mercy of, of life. It's something that we can actually start to implement through wisdom, through understanding the causes that give rise to, to peace, to joy, to, to metta. And some of those causes are also making peace with the difficult emotions. Yeah? Learning a wise way of responding. So when these things are not ours, we have a bit of space there. And in that space, we can put in a wise response. So we can meet things like fear, like guilt, with a real sense of warmth and curiosity, yeah, wanting to get to know what is this emotion telling me? What is the information here in this emotion for me? How does it inform my values? What does it tell me about you know, what matters to me? And of course, these don't have to be like conscious questions, but, Emotions are not useless. You know, I really disagree with what my friend said. Emotions are really valuable sources of information about the way we tick and also how we can learn to handle them in ways that lead to peace. <clears throat> yeah. So this retreat is all about becoming at peace with experience. And again, I just want to emphasize that, you know, it is about learning to relate to things with a sense of peace, with a sense of acceptance and kindness. And over time, it's almost as though the way you relate starts to become so strong that it turns into your object. Yeah. If you make peace long enough with whatever's arising, after notice that now you're aware of peace. It's really incredible. <laughs> but we don't do it to get peace. This is an important uh, point just to end on. Unconditional awareness means being unconditionally aware without expecting any result. If you say, okay, I'll be unconditionally aware of you so that you change and give me a better experience, <laughs> then that's not really unconditional. Yeah. Unconditional means no matter how long you stay, no matter if you stay for the rest of my life, it's okay, anxiety, you have a place in my heart. You're welcome here. I'm not gonna stigmatize you anymore. I'm not gonna push you aside. You have something to teach me and I wanna just be with you. I wanna just give you some company for once. You know, 
happen, that, then that anxiety feels that it's not alone. So just give it a go and we'll do some meditation where I will just give you a few little pointers that may or may not be helpful, depending what you're experiencing from time to time about how you can just approach these emotions and uh, gently learn to incline towards peace. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too much. It felt like I spoke quite quickly and there was a lot there. <laughs> so again, just letting it settle. Don't feel you have to hold on to any of it. The bits that are helpful will come at the right time. So have a little stretch or adjust your posture if you wish. So we'll sit for about 35 minutes or so. I don't need to give you walking. Well, I'll give you a few walking meditation instructions after that because some of you are here for the first time. So straight away, I wanna say that if you're not experiencing any particular emotion, don't worry. <laughs> you don't have to be feeling strong emotions to practice. And as usual, the um, meditation instructions are more like invitations. So if you find something else works better for you at this time, that's absolutely fine. You can just let my words kind of pass over and uh, hopefully they'll keep you awake anyway. <laughs> and just meditate in your normal way. So closing your eyes, if you're comfortable to do that. And letting the impressions of being together in this Zoom room gently fade. Perhaps retaining that sense that you are in the company of spiritual friends. Even though we're on a screen, I, I do sense that there's a very tangible and real energy between us that offers some support in the meditation. So with your eyes closed, you'll be become more aware of your body. And I'd like to invite you to check whether it's really as comfortable as it could be. It's amazing that I know my tendency, but every time I do that, I find my ankles need a little bit more space. And I might adjust my cushion slightly because of that to readjust the position of my back. So making these small adjustments shows your body that you care. And your body feels that it's in the presence of a friend. It feels respected, valued, and a little bit more at ease. For anyone who is here meditating for the first time, you may have seen pictures of meditation postures, but you know, meditation in the Buddhist tradition developed in India where people were used to sitting on the ground. Sometimes we're not used to that and we don't need to do that in order to gain insight and wisdom. So if you prefer to sit on a chair, that's also fine. Or you might want to lean back 
against a wall, against a cushion or a sofa. Perhaps stretch out your legs. So see, first of all, how comfortable it's possible to make your body. And maybe taking three intentional breaths to help you arrive. Enjoying the feeling of the in-breath, the uplift, the inspiration. And allowing the out-breath to fully leave your body, noticing its relaxing effect. Enjoying that sense of being oxygenated. Relaxing on the out breath. You may even let out a sigh. Sensing all your cells in the body, bouncing about full of oxygen. And in your own time, I'd like to, again, suggest that we move our awareness through each and every part of the body using that analogy of the light and the warmth of the sun. So your mindfulness, your awareness is like the light of the sun. And the kindness with which you, you infuse that awareness is like the warmth. So wherever this kindfulness travels, it becomes aware of what's happening. And it also imparts kindness and warmth to any experience in your body or in your mind. If you're a visual person, you may even imagine it soaking through your body like golden sunlight. Noticing any sensations you encounter along the way. Shining upon them equally, impartial, inclusive of all. And noticing how your body responds to this kind, loving awareness. Just as when you're sitting in the warm sunshine, your body starts to relax. So too, you might notice that with this sunshine of kindfulness, tensions, even pain, contracted areas start to open up. It 
It might be very subtle. So just keeping that awareness flowing. Perhaps giving special attention to any areas of tightness. Not getting sucked into those areas, but giving them a lot of space. Just enjoying the presence of loving kindness. And as the light and the warmth of the sun continue to shine, suffuse every part, every cell of your body, you start to see more and more going deeper into this body and mind. Perhaps deeper into your emotional world.
you might not have any names for what you experience and that's fine. The most important thing is just to keep on shining that loving awareness on all the visitors that come to your mind. Staying connected to your body. If you do notice any places in the body which seem tight or contracted, perhaps you might sense there's some emotional holding there. If your mind feels resourced, calm, aware enough, and ready, I invite you just to move in a little bit more closely. Quite often some of the emotional holding is in the chest and the abdomen area. So I'm going to hover my attention in that place. And with the help of the breath, breathe in that loving awareness into all parts of my abdomen. Helping it to relax. Noticing the rise and fall as the breath moves in and out of the abdomen area.
And if any strong emotions are being experienced by you now, you might want to experiment by just gently expanding the sphere of your awareness. To really provide those emotions a lot of space. I've noticed if I feel sad and tears want to flow, it can be helpful to rest my awareness on my hands. Noticing any pleasant sensations there. Maybe on the soles of the feet. Just resting. Allowing your emotional world just to be If you wish, using your breath as an anchor, where you may find if the mind is peaceful, the breath naturally draws you in. Deeper into this moment, into the center of time, Noticing any positive, beneficial, beautiful emotions arising in the mind. Trusting in those. Valuing them. Allowing them to fill the mind. Recognizing that even peace does not belong to you. So if she visits, treat her with as much kindness as possible.
sinking in peace. Valuing her. So before we open our eyes, I'd like to invite you once again to just spread kind awareness through your whole body. Sensing yourself in this embodied form.
taking the time to really value this body, everything it does for us. Send it some gratitude and care. as though you were smiling into the body and also smiling into your emotional world. This rich world of experience that can show us so much about what we really value and how we need to care for ourselves and for all beings. Who all experience various combinations, strengths and intensities of the same emotions that we do. Part and parcel of being human. May we all be happy. May we all be at peace. Okay. Of course, you're welcome to continue meditating. <laughs> In any case, we're just going to move into another posture now. Uh, so now we have a period of walking meditation and that cannot really be done via Zoom. So we really do invite you to participate though in the next session, it's uh, about half an hour or so. And you may find you have more time, depending on your lunch arrangements. So just see how it goes. But the walking meditation, as I said yesterday, is a wonderful way of maintaining this continuity of kind awareness into your daily life. Because most of the time, well, some of the time we're walking and often not in a position to sit closed eyes. So uh, the Buddha talked about four different postures, sitting, walking, standing and lying down. But there are many other postures in between, like bending over the dishes or <laughs> crouching or sitting on the loo. It's a slightly different posture. So any kind of continuity of awareness helps us to, you know, bring that presence of mind into whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and for walking meditation, I'm sorry that many people will have heard this yesterday, but for those who weren't here, um, in the walking meditation, it's good to choose an area. So to choose a length of um, either path outside or maybe the length of your room, perhaps your biggest room or the room that you're using for your meditation retreat. And um, the nice thing is you, you cannot really get anywhere in this walking because you're going to meet the wall ahead of you. So the idea is that we land, we become present with every step. So we're not walking to get somewhere, we're just walking to arrive into each moment. And the movement can help with that because it gives us quite a lot for our mind to become aware of. 
um, you'll notice if you know your awareness is starting to develop through this retreat that you start to become aware of subtle sensations and it's easy to do that when you're lifting up and placing your feet you know there's a lot of activity happening there and a lot of different sensations involved in every movement so if you wish you can have your awareness in those feet in just the moving parts or the parts which are contacting the ground or if you feel like you want to stay with a wider more expansive awareness then you can have your awareness in the whole leg you know, because the whole leg is moving if you really want to you can have it with the whole body it doesn't matter but try to keep your eyes downcast so that you are as much within your body as possible and not get distracted by the birds or the sounds outside of course the exception for that is if you are going through some particularly difficult emotion or you're starting to feel like a bit tight or tense or contracted then you know by all means have a look at the nature outside or go on a walk if you wish. So um, the invitation is to practice the walking. So you walk to one end of the path, you pause, and then you step by step, come back, pause again, turn around and walk. So it's a very nice way of practice. You can choose your own speed. You'll probably find you start to slow down as the mindfulness increases and that's fine too. But be aware if you start to get very slow, that tension doesn't start to creep in, because it can do. Um, especially if we become a little bit too focused on how the foot's actually moving, the actual posture of the foot, we can start to become a bit unnatural and tight. So make it about the experience, the felt experience. And if you do find you're tensing up, just pause, relax your shoulders, relax your body again, and just start again, yeah? So we have about, almost to two and a half hours is it so we're going to meet back here at 1 30 so yeah it's quite a long time uh, sorry my maths has just gone out of the window anyway 1 30 i'm sure you can figure it out and in this time the invitation is just to bring that mindfulness into whatever you do but remember to always couple it with the care so if you want to prepare your lunch you prepare a lunch which is really a gift to yourself. So you make that lunch an offering. You can prepare just as lovely a lunch as you would to a friend, right? We don't need to sort of only keep our best recipes for the times we have guests. We can also prepare our favorite meal for ourselves as well as an, a little offering, a little treat to nourish you on this meditation journey. So do take some care and some time with that. That's why I called it cooking meditation. And also see if you can get a little bit of rest as well. Even if it's just a short rest, sometimes just lying down for, for a moment can be really uh, restful for the body. I was on the Sheffield Insight Retreat as the uh, team told you this morning last year. And I actually managed to really uh, wreck my back <laughs> before I came because I was messing around with my young niece and tried to pull her up. Uh, anyway, she had her feet on my thighs and I tried to pull her up from the ground. <laughs> I used to do things like that with my little sister. But anyway, I'm older now, so I really just yeah wrecked my back. And um, one of the uh, participants and possibly organisers is a Feldenkrais uh, practitioner. And she had me just lie down between the sessions with my knees up. So lying down flat on the floor. And I actually had a book under my head. They do that so that you can your spine can align itself um, fairly naturally. And after a while, the book height could reduce. Anyway, you don't have to do that. But, <laughs> but the idea was that it plumps up the, um, what do you call those bits between your spinal cord, the discs, it plumps them up. And it was amazing just lying like that for 20 minutes. I felt really energized. So there's another little hint for you, if you wish. You can just lie flat on the floor with your knees up and yeah your head on a book <laughs> and uh, see how that feels so whatever you want you can also go to bed i should stop talking before i give you too many weird suggestions i'm sure you know how to best care for yourself so we'll see you back at 1 30 and uh yeah please use this time to care for yourself in whatever way is best for you okay i think um as the organ